Thank you, Lori, very much. <clears throat> From time to time, we receive emails. Oh, church is looking pretty good. You all decided to show up on this cold day, huh? Bless you. From time to time, we receive emails. This one caught my attention. From Jennifer White in England. She wishes us Happy New Year and blessings for the year to come. Then she writes, It has been more than two years since I lost my faith. In that time, I have not attended church and have turned away from God. Interestingly, I came to watch TPC online. I guess all is not lost, though I can't explain why. I do believe that enough continued prayer by God's faithful is the only reason why I'm writing to you. You mentioned a 40-day fast. I'm impressed to participate in that. And I pray that God will do for me what he does for you. Signed, Jennifer White. Could you bow your head as we pray for Jennifer? Jennifer, if you are listening, we lift you up that your quest to be reconnected with God in terms of your knowledge will be fulfilled. But Jennifer, we remind you in this prayer that he has never been disconnected from you. Or you would not have sent me the email. Embrace his presence, O Lord. Help her to embrace your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. We have placed the fasting guidelines now online, so you can go there and check and be sure that you're keeping pace. The main thing that I'm encouraging people to do is don't put anything in your mouth after six. If you just do that, the fast will benefit you physically. We're seeking for the Holy Spirit. I said, we are seeking for the Holy Spirit Amen. to be poured out without measure upon this congregation as we seek to lift our level of participation in God's mission. Pastor Taylor gave us a good start this morning turning our attention to the New Testament church as recorded and revealed in the book of Acts, the second chapter. He challenged us to take that template and to make it our own. Both he and I and others will be spending this month particularly stressing the challenges we face as a people to be one. I pray the Lord will speak to you today as I deal with we are one, part one. Let's pray. Talk now to your people, O God, in Christ's name, amen. Your leadership team did not come up with this theme, we are one, easily. We wrestled back and forth until we felt God's presence literally come into the room. And we became one in our enthusiasm.
one in our enthusiasm, listen to me, that our church family needs to throw off the pretense that we are as close as we think we are. Think about it. It's so simple. How can you be close to someone and you don't even know their name? Seems kind of basic to me, doesn't it? We also face the fact that if this church is going to be a place of hugs, remember that sermon? An acceptance of people in all walks of life. We must be sure that we are ready and know how to make people feel a part of us. For societies have layers, don't they? Layers of acceptance. How a person looks, how a person dresses, what kind of car they drive, just how they look. And we layer them into a certain category. But the grace of Christ is to remove all layers. Isn't that true? I've been your pastor now 32 months, and my observation is that most of us who attend this church don't know most other people who attend this church. But I'm going to go further. I'm going to tweak you more. I also have come to observe that most people who attend this church only show up on Sabbath. If then. And don't support anything else, not even the fellowship dinner. Is that being family? I am still meeting people asking, who proudly proclaim to me, Pastor, I'm a member of the Tacoma Park Church. I've never seen it before in my life. I've been here 32 months. Now, my next four sermons are going to be very straight. Very straight. I want this congregation to become real. I don't want congregation to be just a title. I want it to be who we are. A group of congregants. Who know each other, who feel each other, who miss each other. A place so embroiled and seasoned with knowing and caring and feeling and touching that, that, that when people visit here, they know they've experienced something different. Come on, somebody. Building a church community is more than keeping the same day of worship. Knowing the same hymns. Even having babies blessed by the same pastor. Church family is a unity of, partic of, of, of participation and mission and, and an intentional effort to get to know one another so that there's a spirit, so that there is a spirit that sweeps through these pews when we're together that is tangible and healing. This ought to be a church that if you come sad, you leave glad. Come on, somebody. If you come feeling alone, you leave feeling like you belong. For I say to you again, as I said last fall, that people are looking more for a place to belong than they're looking for things to believe. If you can get people to feel they belong, they'll pay attention to what you believe. But if you only feed them belief, you might convince them mentally you will lose them emotionally. Because they don't fit. They don't fit. The word congregation is a powerful word. Used too loosely, loosely by too many people. Jesus was concerned about it, prayed about it. You're going with me to John 17 and verse 23. He prayed his heart out. It's his last and longest prayer found in scripture, recorded in the book of John. John heard the prayer. John was there when he was praying. John 17 and verse 23, 
And there the Bible declares, I in them and you in me, that they may be that 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 they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you had loved me. That 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 text Anwar is saying a lot. It's saying that the oneness of the hey, hey, the oneness of the church can become proof that Jesus was sent. Why? Because this uncommon fellowship of oneness and love, when people come here, they'll say, there must be a God somewhere for folks who are black and white and tall and short and skinny and fat, getting along like this. Must be some God in this. Then he went on to say in the text, uh, Elder Trevor, that because of that, then the church becomes proof. Watch it now. I can hardly stand this text. The church becomes proof that God loves the world. Avondale, that's a that, that's a powerful thing it, because because in this world, in this, you know, I'm telling the truth. In this world, are people walking right now by this church who don't know anything about love and caring and belonging, and they're looking and they stumble in here. No, they don't stumble. They're led in here by the Holy Spirit. But I don't think he's going to lead many until he knows we can handle many. The challenge we face is, oh, you're going now to Mark, the 10th chapter in verse 37. The challenge we face is, old. it's an old challenge. Mark 10 in verse 37. And you begin to get to the roots, the roots of the problem. And they said to him, wait a minute, let's go to verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatsoever we ask. That's a lot of gall right there. So you know it's not going to be a good request. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? Verse 37. See, I said the problem we have in the church is an old problem. They said to him, grant to us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. Sinners saved by grace having the nerve to walk up to God and say, we have plans for our placement. Yeah. Now, the last time I read my Bible, I don't know about you, I'm just going to be glad to get in. Come on, somebody. I ain't looking for no place, don't need no mansion. I just want to get in. I don't care. Calm down, Henry. If I go first or get in last, just get me in. I don't need a position. I just want to be called saved and forgiven by the grace of God. And these two Negroes, these two people, <laughs> have the nerve to walk up to Jesus and say, we, we, we like the spot on this side and the spot on that side. And Christ in kindness does not put them where they need to be. He just says, I, you, you, you don't realize what you're asking. But I said, Sanjay, that the problem of oneness is old. Here, the church has not been formed yet. The foundation has not been laid. And two of the foundation layers are already showing a lack of oneness by trying to lift themselves above their brothers and have the top spot. There are many people who keep Tacoma Park Church from being one because they're trying to use this church to lift themselves. Don't be looking around, look in the mirror. They're using the church to boost their own sickened egos, to find placement here they don't find out there. But I've read and I've heard and I know that the ground at the cross is level and everybody stands on the same plane. Sinners saved by grace. 
And so that text, Charles Thomas, that you read so well, that text speaks to us. I see them there. It's the Holy Communion service. You can read Luke 22 for yourself. I see them there. It's the Holy Communion service. The Lord God, Ellen White paints him in his hour of ages, is so heavy with our sin now, he's literally moaning. He can barely sit up straight. He moves heavily. All of this gall of selfishness and self-centeredness weighs upon him. And now the stench of self-exaltation in the room almost chokes the Savior to death. He who gives all and seeks nothing for himself can hardly stand the smell of their self-centeredness in that room. And they have the nerve at the communion table to be discussing who is the greatest. It's a wonder that Jesus does not vomit in their presence. With the grape juice in one hand and the undigested bread in their belly, they're discussing who shall be the greatest. With the sacrificing Savior about to give all that he is for the salvation of them, their only concern is not the nails he will bear or the spirit he will have on his side. Their only concern is when it's all over, which one of us shall be called the greatest? The most stupid thing that happens in the church is comparison. Evaluations based on background names, clothes, titles. It is stupid. It makes no sense. And the person that does it immediately announces they've never experienced the grace of God. For true grace humbles you and makes you realize you don't even have the right to call the name of Jesus, let alone be saved by Jesus. How dare I compare myself with somebody else when both of us are lost except for the grace of God. How dare I lift my sin above your sin. Oh, you committed adultery. You're worse than me. I just lie all the time. What text did you read that gave you the right to that kind of comparison? How dare you insult my God? With that kind of foolishness. And so the spirit of competition and the lack of brotherhood began in a place even further away than Galilee and Jerusalem. It is found and recorded and revealed in the book of Isaiah. The prophet tells the story. You're going there with me to the 14th chapter of that book. And there we find the beginnings of a lack of oneness and we are shocked at where it takes place, Isaiah the 14th chapter, beginning in verse 12. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground? You have weakened the nations, for you have said in your heart, said where? Talk to me, where did he say it? See, a lack of unity begins in individual Christians in their head when they self-talk themselves into stupidity. minute you let your mind think that you're better than somebody else. The minute you let the disease of comparison come. In fact, Paul cries out in the book of 1 Corinthians, he says, how dare we compare ourselves among ourselves? He says, it's not wise. So here is Satan in glory, the perfect place. That's the thing, Lodger, that leaves me speechless. It's in the perfect place, Bernice Deshaies. It's in the place, in the presence of God. God, this unity began. In the mind of an angel. Now listen to the next sentence carefully. This unity in the universe and among humans is proof of the love of God. You see, he doesn't force it. Community and unity is a choice. 
We, Lori Preston, beautiful song. Thank you so much. We, 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 we could, uh, see, see, as a congregation, we're, we're presenting ourselves in 2017 with a tremendous opportunity. We can choose to be one, or we continue, we, or we can, conti- we, or we can choose to continue the falsity of being something we aren't. We can make a choice this year, Pastor Smith. We can actually decide amongst ourselves we truly will be one. We will not just go through these exercises that Brother Cecil leads us through. We will take advantage. I'm going to start remembering people's names. I'm going to, I'm going to give people the gift of belonging. I have contended as I train young pastors all over the world, I've can still continue that the greatest gift a pastor gives a member is to call them by their name. But don't just put it on me. Say, like a pastor, you have a gift. You remember names. Ah, it's now your turn. Yeah, I remember names. I work at it. But it's your turn. Because the pastor is one person. But hey, suppose, help. Whoa. Suppose you walk in church one Sabbath, and before you get to your seat, 20 people call you by your name. You'll be strutting. You won't be able to sit down. Walk it on cloud night. Hey, I've known all. Hey, they call my name. You'll be telling your friends, I go to my church. Everybody knows me. It will be a powerful force. We're not just playing games here. We're trying to be something extraordinary. Because this disease started in the very presence of God. So lack of unity because of self-thinking is a powerful force. It disrupted heaven. One third of the holy angels lost their place with God over this foolishness. And then you're, with, you're, 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 you're going with me now to the book of Genesis. This, this insidious spirit was, was transferred to this planet. Look at it. Genesis 3 and verse 8. You read that story. Sin chills up and down my spine. Here they've just sinned. They've eaten the fruit. Just two of them. Just two, just two, 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 two. Just two people. Not 40, not 22. Not just two. Two, two, just two people. And look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse 9, then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where art thou? Verse 10, he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree from, from the tree which I command you that you should not eat? And the man said, The woman? Two people? It's over! Peace is over, ladies. You know it's over. She wanted to take one of them limbs and hit him upside his head. He sold her out, threw her under the bus, right in front of God. Two people, two people. Now, you know if two people can't get along, you know why we got problems. I'm trying to tell you that this insidious disease of a lack of oneness goes way back in our history. Just two people. But note, 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 note the power of it. Because in Genesis 2 and verse 25 it says, And the twain, did, and the twain shall be one flesh. Thirteen verses later, they are not hardly speaking. Because when Adam went back behind that bush where she was, you can be sure she was not smiling. <laughs> you smile, but we throw each other under the bus all the time. With attitudes of a lack of forgiveness, somebody fails and falls short in church and becomes the gossip of the whole congregation rather than prayer and calling and making sure that person is healed and feels fine coming back to church. We throw it under the bus all the time by acting like what somebody else has done is worse than what we have done. We throw people under the bus all the time by repeating over and over again their faults and their failings, forgetting that if God has wiped the sin from the books of glory, surely you ought to keep your mouth shut about that same sin. Two people. Anastasia, two people. Not a nation. Not a family. Just two folks. 
I'm trying to show you how easy it is for folks not to get along. But he did it to marriage. Frank and Jocelyn, he did it to marriage. Y'all act right now. Marriage. Sister King, you, Brother King, marriage. Do you know, now see, don't y'all sit there all, all pious. You know, you know, people who are married, you know, it's a miracle. Think about what I'm saying now. Don't sit there all pious. It's a miracle. Two people live together. Two different sexes. Hopefully, two different sexes. I'm just speaking the truth as it is in God's name. Two different sexes, two different backgrounds, two different sets of DNA, two different backgrounds and histories, and you're going to live together for 50 years? You know that's a miracle in God's name. He attacked marriage, the groundwork of all human relationships. Smart man. Devil was a smart man. He knew that if he could keep the basic human relationship from operating securely and safely, he could mess up the whole human race, and he has been successful. Now, I got some sermons for you in February. You should have come in February. You should have saved this visit in January and come in February. Because <laughs> in February, I got some sermons for you about folks getting along at home. See, 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 marriage is the test tube of the human family. You know, people, people, you know, people, two people, don't, don't, they, don't, they, they don't even squeeze the toothpaste tube alike. One picks up stuff, one doesn't. Am I telling the truth about it? Yeah, one chews and smacks, the other chews very petitely and sweet. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You know I'm telling the truth here. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're living together. And the thing about marriage is, see, here's what marriage is the test to, because see, in marriage, you just can't get up and walk out the house. See, when you're dating, you can drop them off. God bless you. See you in, see in the kingdom, because we ain't going out again. See, in the kingdom, see, I'm preaching, I'm, I'm, I'm in February stuff already. See, in the kingdom, but in marriage, you got to go upstairs together. <laughs> Pastor's trying to say to you, and remember, the marriage is the backbone of the church. So if couples can't get along, how the church going to get along? Yeah. Sitting next to each other in church and not speaking? Trying to play through because you're an elder, an elder. So you want anybody to know you and the wife ain't getting along. You got to sit there next to them. Don't want them to touch you. Don't want to feel their hips against your hips at all because you're upset and mad. All right, let me get back to January. That's February sermon. I got caught up in that thing, Chris. I couldn't turn it loose. I got some stuff to say to you because I understand the, the problem and challenge we have trying to be one. God pray for the pastor. <laughs> So in Genesis 4, I got, I, got, I got Genesis 3. Genesis 4, 8, we say it again. Two brothers, they murder one another. Folk, are you seeing our problem? So you have relatives in church. Let's forget about husbands and wives. You have sisters in church and brothers in church and cousins in church and aunts and nieces in church and grandparents in church. Families coming to the same church and they're not getting along. How therefore can the church be one? Satan has attacked us from all the ends. And yet, I believe, folk, if Jesus prays for something, it can happen. He prayed that they all may be one. Now, if Jesus believes it, come on, y'all, let's believe it. If Christ prayed for us, then let's live the prayer. Of course, then in Genesis 6, 6, 11, by the time you get to the 6th chapter of Genesis, it says the earth was just corrupt, violence. Nobody was getting along with anybody. And so the strife builds Jacob and Esau, Joseph and his brothers, kingdom against kingdom, tribe against tribe, nation 
against nation. And we all know the cause. Sin. Say the word. Any time you find yourself having trouble getting along with anybody, sin. It's just the fruits of sin. The Spirit manifested in my key text in Luke, where they argued about who would be the greatest. The Spirit in that room was so strong that even bread broken by the hands of the Savior and a worship service did not quiet this human upsmanship and self-centeredness. The quiet, they were not even moved by the quiet, broken spirit of the Master. They continued their dismissive attitudes to the point that when Christ needed them most, the Bible embarrassingly says they all forsook him and fled. And so Luke 22 paints it. Go there with me. Go there with me. Luke 22 paints it. Luke, the historian, wants to leave nothing out. He, he interviewed the disciples. He wanted to be sure that this sad story was not missed. Verses 22 and 23, Luke reveals there was a betrayer in the room. Folks, this is the church. He's been working now for three and a half years, Brother Palmer, trying to build himself a church. Now, here he comes, in his closing days, Reggie, Reggie, with the church. The Savior needs a boost. Maybe in these three and a half years, I've at least taught them to get along. You see what Satan was doing to Jesus? He was trying to undermine his faith in the possibilities of the church. That I got good news for you this morning. Christ has not given up. He believes we can be one. So there's betrayers there, according to verses 22 and 23. Evil ambition, we read that, verse 24. The spirit of denial, verse 31. He says to Peter, you're going you're gonna to deny me, you're going to betray me. Peter says, no way, no way is that going to happen. And then in verse 45, we read, and when he rose up from prayer, he had come to disciples, he found them sleeping with sorrow. They didn't even have, they didn't, they didn't even have unity in their spiritual stamina. I smiled. I got, a, I got an email from a person saying, Pastor, why have you chosen such a trivial thing as, as oneness, as the goal for the church in 2017? Oh, yeah, I got, I got that email. It was a file 13er, but I read it before I... But it shows, folk, how unaware we are of the danger of disunity. We don't see it for the evil that it is. And I would suggest to you today that it's one of the main things that's keeping the Christian church from having power. And if you've gone ahead in these studies on the Holy Spirit, one of the lessons is going to point that out. The church is crippled by the lack of power that comes from being unified in Jesus Christ. There is a reason why after he was crucified and ascended, he drove them to an upper room to spend time there praying until they had so unified they became irresistible to heaven and it poured out itself in flames of fire. Filled them up. God could not resist this moment of unity and filled them with power. No, this is not a trivial thing that we deal with here. John 19. John 19. Beginning, I'll go back to verse 31. Verse 31. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken. 
that they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came, verse 32, broke the legs of the first and of the other, who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. You have read this. Because in verse 34 it points out when they put the spear in his side, spear in his side there came out blood and water. Commentary says that Jesus dies of a broken heart as a result of the awful pressure of the weight of the sins of the world. You see, what did he see, Brother Cecil Calis Sr. on that cross? The unifying Savior? The Savior who was one with the Father and one with the Spirit? The Savior who gave up this atmosphere, this ambiance of constant unity and peace and came down? And what did he see? Even after three and a half years, he saw church members not getting along, grappling one with another for the highest spot. He saw Roman soldiers pushing back Jewish citizens. And then he saw the soldiers at the bottom of his cross casting lots for his very, very clothing. He looked out and he saw the priests calling him names, the leaders of the church, totally separated from the people. All he saw, this man of peace and love and glory and giving and you all he saw was the awful stench miasma the cesspool of human disunity he could not take it it broke his heart it broke his heart to see a christian husband arguing with his christian wife it breaks his heart to see young people in Tacoma Park Church disrespecting the adults in the church and the adults not being patient with the young people. It breaks his heart when he sees deacons not getting along serving on the same deacon board. It breaks his heart when elders do not do their full duties and then blame other elders because they do not. It breaks his heart when members sit in church with this tithe money in their place and make excuses for not trusting the grace of God, breaks his heart to see us not forgiving those people in the church who are harassing with sin and weakness and talking about them and not receiving them. It breaks his heart that all that he slaved and died for has not been fixed by his grace. He cannot take it and he bleeds blood and water. It breaks his heart that the one organization he has formed, the church, that's to win the world with love. It breaks his heart that the people he's using to win the world with love, they themselves don't love one another. And Christ must ask himself, is it worth it? But he declares, I have faith in them. In fact, he says, Henry Wright, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you just let me in, he declares, I'll let you be all you need to be. Just get out of my way, Tacoma Park. Just get out of my way. Let me do the loving. You're too messed up. You're too jacked up. You're too full of self. Kill self. Let me in. And I'll show you what a loving, treasured, special place Tacoma Park can be. The lack of oneness on this planet killed God in human form. I'm closing now. This is how the Bible describes God. This is how the Bible describes God. There are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. First John 5, 7. And then the Bible tells me that we were made, Charlene, in his image. Now come on, Delbert Pierman. If I am made, and we are made in God's image, and God is one, that tells me we got some possibilities here. <laughs> we can pull this thing off. 
We can be one. We can shut the devil's mouth and leave him speechless. Shocked that there's been a breakthrough in Tacoma Park Church, that the pews are filled with people who are one, who don't care anything about race and station and texture of hair and background. We're just full of Jesus. And every time we see a human being, we see Jesus in the flesh. And we treat everybody like he is the son and daughter of God. John 17, 21. That they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me. Man. And I in you. Wow. That they also may be one in us. Oh, that the world may believe that you have sent me. I'll take it. Come on, church. You want to try? You want to try for this? Come on, saints. Can we pull this off? Well, I've just offered you a simple assignment. Let's just start, Nicole, by just knowing each other's names. Amen. <laughs> Charles and Renee. Amari, sitting next to little Elijah. Just go, Teo. Just call folks by the name, Charity and Kevin. Call them by the name. Call people's name. Just call people's name. Just let people then to find some place. You know, come and sit next to them. Don't just sit down, get all pious. Turn around and say, hi, Linda. Come on, somebody. Let's make this thing work. Simple assignment. I know some of you got an attitude when you came in. I don't want to wear a name. We don't know you. Put your name on. I've been a member of this church for 40 years, and you got 40 people who don't know your name. Wear the name. Wear the name. Let's build a bridge, Dr. Deshay. Let's build a bridge between us. Can we do it? I'm asking my congregation, can we do it? Bow your head. Holy Spirit, make us one. Lord God, I have come to love these people. I've come to believe in the congregation that I pastor. You have not brought us together for this short journey together to be in vain. We've already shown in the past 30 some months we can take on this community, but we got to do more. We're growing in faith and belief, but we got to grow stronger. We're getting more and more unified in purpose, but more unified we must be. Ah. And we have accepted the same destiny. One day we shall walk on streets of gold and look in the face of the man called Jesus. We are one in you. And so, Lord, make us one. <laughs> Make us one, Lord. Make us one. Holy Spirit, make us one. And we pause now to pray. 
Everyone right now is praying a prayer for the Holy Spirit. But I want you to pray out, pray out loud your prayer all at the same time. You may begin praying for the Holy Spirit. Everybody together, praying. Pray your prayer. Pray your prayer for the Holy Spirit. Let me hear more voices praying. It's called a Pentecostal prayer. All people praying out loud together. Pray, 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 pray. Now, Lord, as we close, oneness as a people begins with oneness with you. And so online, if you're listening and you've never made that commitment of oneness with Jesus, I invite you to do that now and share with our online pastor your commitment and if you're sitting here in this congregation and you've never risen from your seat and come down to this front pew to say you want to be one with Jesus one with this church you want to receive Bible study or by transfer of membership you want to become one with this congregation if you've not made that decision just rise and come now let me give you a moment you're all praying. No one's looking around. Is there someone who will do that now? Well, Pastor, I didn't plan on doing that. That's why I asked. It's best to do things for the Lord when you did not plan. Do you come? sit by this man and wife who've come down together. Anybody else? Father, I thank you. We've taken on quite a challenge this year, but we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Thank you for speaking to our hearts. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen. Are you glad you came to church today? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. We will now call for the tithes and the offering.